afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm afraid the room, the room may sink to this side. The way I see it, it looks like this. Uh, good afternoon. I was asked to introduce the speaker of today, and I must say I'm completely embarrassed because I don't know anything about him. <laughs> totally new to me. Amos uh, started to work on uh, neuroscience in about 1970-something, uh, together with us in the lab in Jerusalem. Uh, we had a wonderful many years of working to of work together, and it's only uh, a shame that he is sitting there in the Hobart and not here, but this is life. And he's always coming with new ideas, new thoughts, new theories, dreams. And I hope he will share with you today what he is doing in the last several years. Uh, I think uh, you will enjoy. So Amos comes from the Weizmann Institute, where he is doing uh, mainly behavioral experiments now, I believe. And this time you see the title, it's about the eye movements we make when we want to see the world. Together with about the EG. More or less. Oh, together with the EG, okay. So, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Mr. Okay. Hello to everybody. I will begin well with an ex with doing on you an experiment that will show will put everything that I would say later in proportion because it will probably show that eye movements are not needed. So uh, what I will do, I will show you a, a picture for 100 milliseconds for 0 0.1 seconds and you try to see and tell me what is in the picture. So are you ready? One, two, three. Who did see something? This is a picture. And the answer is usually fruit, even though many people saw only one fruit. And many people say that it's Coca-Cola or mineral water, even though you cannot go through this bottle and not see uh, that it is different. And the uh, fact that I'm showing it is because this is enormous complicated picture and even though it was shown for 10 milliseconds people see it even though I guess nobody saw the cheese here or the knife but people saw things had the impression that they see it and that means that we can talk about input driven system input activated processing processing that requires input and without the input the system waits and uh, we don't need some eye movement or anything that will be done on the input because the input was shown for 100 milliseconds and even though uh, and we could not do intentional eye movement at that time and even though we succeed uh, to see. An input defined processing, processing defined output in one way sequence and the world creates sensation which reflect reality according to the input driven uh, system. Um, according to this view, if we take the brain and we look at it, the brain is often described as a system of sequential stations that we go from the eye to the brain, we do some processing in the brain and then we go and we do some movement as a one direction system uh, that as a one direction system. Uh, an alternative view, and a view that I'm much more believing in it, is that input and output are part of a circle, and we're talking about active sensing system, where prediction and expectation, when we go to a room, we have prediction and expectation, they can create output, or the input can create uh, prediction and expectation, and there is a context in which we are, and all those together, uh, they create perception, and we have a loop that we cannot tell 
where does it begin and where does it end? And we process differently the world as the context is changing, prediction and expectation. We create con and construct our world and it's not just input driven. And in active system, we, they alter their own input and we have uh, 10 times more output from the cortex to the thalamus than input from the thalamus to the cortex. And the final process can alter its own initial process data and allows people to deal with context effects that computers find it difficult. And when we look at the cortex, we find that 95% of the fibers are between our corticocortical fibers. The cortex is dealing a lot with itself, and the input is some artifact that goes into the system in that sense. 5% is input and output. And uh, when such context effects are usually useful, as the one that is demonstrated here, world meaning creates sentence meaning, sentence meaning also affects world winning, meaning, and one way processing cannot handle context effects, where the whole alters the path that creates it. And this is just an example that people probably know. I don't know why doesn't it work here. What? What was the example? What was the example of? Repetition blind. Repetition blind. One bird in the bush. A bird in the bush. Do you see it? In, okay, a bird in the, the bush. Okay. So we read we read the context. We don't see we don't stop on each word as people saw mineral water in the beginning, uh, and uh, or a bottle that is not defined even even though they had to go through the details of the bottle in order to see it. So here it changed blindness. It doesn't work from here. Usually it, uh, it has a flash between two, uh, two uh, slides. In one there is no engine, in the other there is engine, and we don't see uh, the change. Uh, so all of that is in order to show that uh, the brain is process driven, and uh, for a lo long period I'm claiming that maybe the context is ongoing activity that is created everywhere in the cortex and we have a closed loop uh, system where, uh, where the output can change the input, the eye movement, and the eye movement and the context are uh, modifying uh, the sensory uh, percept, etc. And what I want to talk today is about miniature eye movement, and to that we should add also the way that the eye is structured, and the eye structure that in a way that we have the fovea, and in the fovea we have large mass of uh, or a high dense of photoreceptor, and the acuity there is more than 10 times higher than the periphery, and because of that we have to do all the time to shift our gaze position toward the different places, and this is some simulations that show what do we see at every moment, and we combine what we see in time in order to have the feeling that we see at once the whole uh, picture. And uh, as an example, and uh, those are due to saccades, and these are from the work of Yabus that shows that when we look at the picture, we, the saccades are not uh, random, they are going, and we can really see the shape of the face from the saccade, and uh, what we see depends a lot on the saccade. This is a famous picture that the execution of Lady uh, Jane that was in the London National Gallery, and they put the picture in a way that people, when they looked at the picture, they measured the eye movement. So this is Lady Grey that was nine days a queen, and uh, here her head will be in a moment, and this is the executor with his axe, and this is the servant of her, 
And when people look at this picture, those are the eye movements that people do, so they are far from being random. And they're already here, there is a closed loop that if we don't know what is a picture, how do we refer our gaze to certain place that is a very important place, and how do we find out where to look, and how do we know at the end what we see. And the last example, I think, is that if we look here, we see a duck, and if we look here, we see a rabbit. So where we look has a large influence on what is we see. This is another example of change blindness. If somebody sees a difference between the two slides, raise the them, don't shout. Who doesn't see? Okay, most of the people. So the difference is in here between this one. It's just in the center of the image, and uh, it is not somewhere in the side. And when we look at our eye movement, this is from the work of O'Keefe, we don't look at this bench, we look at the faces, and we look at the hands of the people, but we don't look at that place, and that can be one of the reasons why we don't see a change that happens just in the center of the image uh, that we look at. So this is true not only for vision, it's true for uh, sensation with the fingers or for uh, the whiskers that uh, uh, mice and rats are using as the fingers. And everywhere we need some active sensing in order to feel and to uh, uh, know the world. So what I will talk today is about three topics. One is fixational eye movement and whether there is a retinal locus of fixation, I will explain what it is. The second is some about, something about free viewing and the role of Saka during fixation and during free viewing. And the last topic that we are in the beginning of it, or in the middle of the beginning of it, is about eye-brain dynamic during the emergence of visual perceptual awareness in human in 3D world. So, you can see here some of the fixation on eye movement. There is the drift. The drift is the small movement that you see. That you see here, this is the drift on it. The small, the small movement here are the tremor that can be up to 100 hertz. And each time we have a saccade that brings us back to the point of fixation in between drift and tremor. We have saccade, and those are the main micro saccades, those are the main uh, eye movement during fixation. And the question that I will, uh, um, and questions that people try to answer, and they think that the fixation eye movement function is to maintain stable fixation, so we have micro saccade to overcome the tremor and the drift that is done by the system. We have two muscles that are very fast muscle, and in between them we can have a tremor, and, uh, and the drift could be the random walk of the tremor. So maintaining stable fixation is one of the function of uh, fixational eye movement. Optimize, optimizing vision against fading of the retinal image that were stabilized on, on the retina is another thing. Uh, visual acuity, scanning of small spatial region, uh, attention, multi-stable vision, all of those things that people uh, uh, think that fixation and eye movement are related to, but nothing of it is really established. And the fixation eye movement is drift, tremor, and micro saccade, and to that one should add many other movements that about. Some of them I will talk later. So the question that I will ask is, is there a correlation between fixation and eye movement parameters and visual performance? Uh, does the visual world influence fixation and eye movement parameters? And if yes, then which part of the fixation and eye movement or the, what we perceive? And I will begin with fixation and eye movement uh, during fixation about the hypothesis of the locus of fixation, uh, and for that I have to define visual fixation is maintaining of fixed visual line 
from the eye to the target, and the retinal locus is, is fixation, or fixation is the distribution of retinal position used during fixation. So the area that on it the image is fold, this is the um, uh, retinal locus of fixation, and uh, it, people use the term optimal locus as the traditional view is that a small region, few arc minutes, arc minutes we have 60 arc minutes in a, in, a, in, a, in a degree, with the center of the fovea serves an optimal locus of fixation. That means that the same locus is used on each experimental trial, and if we go out of it because of the eye movement, then we do micro saccade or some correction in order to go back into this area. Now, uh, we hypothesized due to the fact, and I will explain you later, that we saw that all the eye trackers do not have good resolution, resolution more than one degree, even though the technique is advancing tremendously, and then we raise the possibility that we don't put the stimulus all the time on the same place in the eye, but we put it on a larger area. So we hypothesized because of technical difficulty that we use the entire rod-free fovea for fixation. This is more than twice or three times the area, and uh, which has roughly equal resolution capability. And just to uh, understand what I'm talking about, so uh, you can see here the fovea about five degrees, and the rod-free fovea without cones about 1.2, 1.7 degrees. And the foveola without capillaries of blood is about one degree. And the s free, the place that doesn't have blue photoreceptor, this is the 25 arc minutes. This is the size of the area that people claim that when we fixate, we bring each time the stimulus toward that place. So uh, fixation performance are technically can be expressed in two ways. One way is the distribution of uh, the retinal area used during a single fixation. This is each one of the different uh, colors of dots. And the other one is refixation precision, the retinal area used during repeated fixation. When we come back to the same area, how big is the area that we use in order to, to return to the same place? And uh, the fixation is stability never mind, is uh, uh, quantified by a leap that has 68% of the dots uh, in it. And this ellipse corresponds to a circle of 20, 30 uh, uh, minutes of arc. And that's why the claim all the year was that we have a, a, um, a, an area, small area that we use all the time in order to return to fixate. Um, so it corresponds to, to the foveola, the area that is uh, uh, free from s cone, from the cones that are sensitive to blue. Uh, however, I should mention that all those experiments that have very high sensitivity, uh, and we need high sensitivity in order to do it, they were done while people were fixating to the center of the screen. And there are very few experiments that were done not in the center of the screen. And uh, uh, natural viewing is very far from all the time looking, looking just straight ahead. Just to give an example, this is the point of cal cal for calibration, the eye tracker. And each time we have to move our gaze to a different place. And uh, the question is whether we use uh, regular viewing, whether this point is still, this area is still so small. So, uh, um, so the optimal locus, if we take it as something that exists, then if we do calibration, then each time we move every time to the same area as demonstrated here in the slide, and that then we get the 20, 25 minutes of arc. But if we use the entire rod-free fovea, 
then each time we can use different place, like here in this uh, demonstration. And when we do such a thing, the precision of the eye tracker will, ne will not be better than the distribution of, on the retina that we used when we did calibration. And then that can explain why all the eye trackers that are all the time improving remain with the same, uh, with the same precision. So this is what we wanted to check, and we designed a special visual stimulus for forcing participants to place the stimulus image on a restricted and high defined area on the retina, and then we compared fixation stability and refixation uh, precision to control stimulus in order to examine what do we do when we look at something. So we chose the rod-free area the ESCOM free area in the retina, the place where we don't have cones for blue. And we designed a stimulus. This is 20, 25 minutes of arc. We designed the stimulus that people looked at it and they had to tell us whether the blue disappeared. So we began with very small stimulus. It disappeared. They did arrow up. It became larger, disappeared up, larger, till it didn't disappear, that we went one step down. It's very short to do it, one minute, two minutes. And we get the size of the, what we call challenged, challenged fovea stimulus CFS. And then this uh, calibration, people looked at the stimulus till it became black. When it became black, they pressed the mouse. And when it returned to blue, they released the mouse. And they did it for a control stimulus black when they were sure that they are fixating or when the blue uh, disappeared. And we did it everywhere on the screen. And two calibration type, two stimulus type, fixation both central and periphery, 11 participants. Here you can see the red are the calibration point the uh, control is a green, and the special device stimulus is a blue, but the calibration was done using control stimuli. And you can see the, how, you can see the distribution. Here you can see the distribution when we use for doing calibration, we use the, um, uh, you, we use the special stimulus, and you can see how small it is how much smaller the blue area relative to the green area. So it looks as if uh, people, when they use the stimulus, they fixate on much smaller area. And this is the case. It is two, two times better to do calibration when you use a special delivered stimuli. And just to demonstrate it, you can see it here. This is using control stimuli. Those are the eye movements of uh, each one of the line is fixation. And you can see refixation. Oh, disappeared. OK, never mind. It had to show the ellipse, but it didn't show. So this is another subject, the ellipse, when you use control stimuli. And this is when you use the special stimuli. See how much la smaller. So those are two subjects, and here are another two subjects, and you can really see that when you use a special delivery stimuli, then uh, the area is about two t twice as small as you get when you use the big one. And when you look at the area that contains 68% of the refixation stability, uh, the improvement is very large, very significant, and uh, by that it looks as if we made our point that when we fixate to different places, uh, we look at much larger areas than people claim, uh, one minute, people claim that we use. But we still wanted to, uh, to do the experiment that everybody else did to see that when we look at the center, we get the same result as other lab got at the center of the screen. Yes. Uh, 
the dense of the photoreceptors on the Y direction is almost twice uh, uh, smaller than on the vertical direction. So it looks like a, a lip because this is the relation between the horizontal and vertical direction of the retinal uh, uh, density of the photoreceptors. Okay. So uh, we went back and we did the experiment that everyone else in the world did at the center of the screen. And what we did is, this is uh, for experienced uh, uh, people, uh, subjects, and for unexperienced subjects. And you can see that when you look at the center of the screen, you, got, you, got, you get the same result as we got at every other point on the screen. So there is a locus of fixation only when the stimulus is straight ahead, uh, zero degree in front of you. Every other place in the world, and we didn't measure how much you have to go far from that, is uh, you use the entire uh, rod-free uh, entire foveola. So we confirmed that the retinal area correspond to an optimal locus and is used only during central fixation and during fixation to the periphery large retinal, air, retinal area is used and now this is a little bit till now it was a little bit more technically now going back to the question is there a correlation between fixation and eye movement parameter and visual performance? Does the visual world influence fixation eye movement parameters? And if yes, then which part? This is what you will see next out of those, the same experiments. And what you see here is the analysis that usually people do to spikes, but we did them to microsaccade. So time zero is the time that stimulus appeared. Uh, not stimulus appeared, that the people pressed on the mouse, either because it was controlled stimulus and they were fixating on it, or because they had a special delivery. And this is the PSTH, the average saccade per trial uh, during, uh, during the time before and after uh, people pressed the mouse. Now, this is only the saccade during the CFS, during the special delivery, and this is all the rest, and you can see that there are a little bit less micro saccade, but not uh, much uh, during, um, during the special stimulus that we uh, gave them. The same thing here you see here, but on the amplitude of the saccade. So this is the average per trial uh, amplitude of saccade, and if we uh, uh, divide the amplitude by the uh, rate per trial, then we get here, what you see here is the uh, uh, amplitude of the saccade per micro saccade related to time zero on before and after. And as you can see here, it doesn't change during the time that they press. But if here we go to the amplitude of the a micro saccade during the time that they had the special stimulus, it's much smaller than if you go to the uh, amplitude during the control stimulus. So they don't change by much the rate of the micro, micro saccade, they change the amplitude of the micro saccade. Yes? Yeah. It is for what? It doesn't matter. It's the same for trained and untrained subjects as uh, um, you could saw. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the case. So the mean micro saccade amplitude is smaller, significantly smaller. And now what we did, we did autocorrelation of the <laughs> micro saccade. And when you do autocorrelation of micro saccade, autocorrelation tells you when there was a micro socket, what is the probability to have another micro socket? So there is a time, like in spike, that you have absolute refractory period. There is time that you don't have socket. And then you have two large peaks here uh, that are due. This is rate of socket, and this is uh, auto, not autocorrelation. This is correlating time of socket on the amplitude of it. So 
when you divide this one by that one, then you get, you get the amplitude per saccade at time that goes up and goes down before saccade occurred. And here you can see much better how small is the amplitude of the micro saccade relative to the uh, other amplitude. We use that kind of technique because trials, you don't have so many trials, and each trial you have only about two micro saccade. But when you do it per micro saccade, you get much larger numbers, and then the, uh, the phenomena is much more significant. Now, why do you get those peaks here? You get those peaks here. This is just another scale, 600 milliseconds. You get those peaks because after a saccade, you have a tendency to have an overshoot. You can see here a saccade, overshoot, saccade, overshoot, saccade, overshoot. And people think that it's a correcting saccade, but we don't think so because it doesn't matter how big is the saccade always. Uh, the size of the, of the overshoot is independent of the size of the saccade. Um, we took, we merged the overshoot together with the main saccade in order to eliminate this peak that we have in the center in order to see better the result. And this is the merge. So from the beginning, the saccade began till the end of the saccade, including the uh, overshoot. And then you can see here, you can see that the dynamic of saccade rate does not change during our special, special delivery stimulus, but the amplitude of the saccade is much smaller. So we can, stimulus can influence the size of the micro saccade and uh, also the size of the drift. When we take out the saccade out, we see that also the size of the saccade of the drift becomes smaller. To my best knowledge, nobody has shown that, um, uh, that this is the case. Is the overshoot exactly in the opposite direction? Yeah, that's how you define overshoot define also. Overshoot. You define overshoot, but usually when, if you have a strong ballistic uh, movement uh, that is the saccade, the overshoot is in, on the other direction. Now the next question was how much we can control the saccade. So here we showed that the amplitude is controlled, but people who reach the uh, place that uh, uh, the CFS disappeared, the area that is free of blue, can they do it intentionally or it happens randomly? That was the question. And in order to answer it, we measured parameters. You have from the point of fixation, large uh, saccade towards the place that you see the target. 200 milliseconds afterwards, that's the place in arc minute that you are. So there is no difference, uh, significant difference between the two. What we see is that it takes, this is the control stimuli, this is the CFS, the special delivery stimulus. This is uh, our pupil, is the actual distance covered in the final one degree or in the final 25 minutes of arc, and you see that you cover three times larger area when we use the special delivery stimuli, and it takes three times more three, three times more time to reach the place. So it looks as if we do it completely random. We just go and go and go and go till we reach the place, and that's why we do three times more movement, and it takes us three times more. Uh, 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 three times more time. And we checked it quantitatively, uh, and I will not go through it because we don't have time, but we'll, I will just say that it looks completely random. And uh, I think this demonstration will show much better the point. So blue is a single trial CFS, red is a single trial uh, uh, control and the press was the stop is when the person uh, reached and pressed the mouse that it doesn't see anymore. Uh, so we took uh, several steps before the person pressed on the mouse. The blue per definition always will end at the center 
and the red will end relative to it, so don't look at the time to the place it ended, but just how random it is. This is the first subject, and this is another subject, and you can see that even when he's in, he can go out, he doesn't know exactly, only perceptually he knows according to the perception, and then he stops. Yeah. The speed of the movements, are they real time? Or is it Again? The speed of the movements yeah. in the demonstration, yeah. are they live? Oh, uh, uh, this is real time, uh, yeah. no. no. I don't remember the relation, but this is around uh, Um, I don't know to say, I can faster tell you from the table before, but... Uh, faster or slower? Just no, no, much, more, much slower. Um, oh, one minute. In order to answer it, uh, so it takes, the time it takes you from one degree to go to the center, uh, the time that it takes you, duration one degree, is about uh, 800... Uh, uh, Something like 3.2 seconds. Oh, so so. That's, that's the time that it takes you till you, from the moment that the stimulus went, uh, was one degree from the center till you press the mouse key. So this looks quite similar to what you... Have Could be. Uh, I didn't uh, examine the movie uh, in relation to that aspect. So... To conclude this kind of experiment, a significant increase in the accuracy of the gaze position up to three times is achieved by this special stimuli. This can improve almost any eye tracker in the world just by using this special delivery stimuli that is very simple stimuli. The calibration takes the same time as using regular stimuli. Uh, and uh, in addition, we find a significant decrease in micro saccade rate and amplitude as well as in drift amplitude. And uh, our result, we can say strictly that they disprove the traditional view of existence of a small invariant optimal locus uh, that the eye is using. And when you go out of it, the, you intentionally do a micro saccade in order to go back into it. So this is during fixation. What happened during free viewing? So during free viewing, uh, when you look at fixation, this is when you look at fixation about, this is the horizontal trace of an eye tracker. Those are the micro saccade. So you see a lot of micro saccade, something like two per second, micro saccade in the horizontal trace. When you look at the vertical trace of the eye tracker, you see much smaller uh, um, micro saccade and much, much, much smaller and much more rare. And the relationship between the horizontal and the vertical micro saccade is about five times more in frequency and also they are bigger in amplitude and, uh, uh, and it's not known exactly why it is, but this is a fact known for long period. When you go to, so when you look at the typical fixation, the red are the micro saccade, and you can see that you have mostly horizontally, horizontal micro saccade, even so you can get the impression that is, there is a drift here that is mainly uh, vertical. And because of that, we decided to do the following experiment that you will see in a moment. But what happened during free viewing? In free viewing, you see the point of fixation. This is free viewing of a subject in our, li in our lab looking at that picture. So people search all over the picture. Those are the points that they fixate, different points that they fixate. And when you do it, you see that the amount of saccade, not micro saccade, during free viewing is almost equal horizontally and vertically. So this is free viewing. The blue are the amplitude, the, the uh, peak amplitude of the saccade as a function of the amplitude of the saccade. Blue is the vertical one. Red is a, a blue is a horizontal one. Red is a vertical one. And they are a little bit different, but both of them exist almost 
the same. When you go to fixation, those are the micro saccade and saccade during fixation, and you can see that almost you get, not almost, but you get much more vertic uh, horizontal micro saccade than vertical micro saccade. So during free viewing, it's almost the same. Yeah. Can you talk louder? I don't hear. Yes, the small nano saccades that you are showing. Yeah. Are they just the, the uh, thermodynamic activity of the lattice fibers that are not simply keeping in the same position, or, or do you think that they are uh, under the run of control? So, people claim saccades are ballistic movement that uh, goes very orderly according, that's why you get the peak amplitude is a linear function of the uh, of the of the peak velocity is a linear function of the amplitude when you go to micro saccade people don't know what the function of micro saccade some of the people claim and there is evidence that it helps you to go back to fixation point because you have drift and tremor that is uncontrolled and it is independent in each one of the eyes so each eye is moving like uh, in diffusion to different places, and then the micro saccade bring you back. Uh, some people claim that uh, it's due to the fact that fixation is not something natural, so once in a while you have uh, un... Uh, how do you call it? Loretoni, un... Involuntary. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> saccade, and there are many other explanations for it, but altogether you can see that what remains is the horizontal one and not the vertical. And w there are two possibilities that we, there are more possibilities, but two that one can think about is the first that when you go to fixation, you succeed to suppress mostly the vertical saccade and not the horizontal one. This is one possibility. Second possibility is that when you reach small amplitude of saccades, those are the micro saccades, those suppress the vertical saccade. So one, the amplitude is so small that it suppresses the vertical saccade. For doing vertical saccade, it involves two, uh, two um, um, nuclei uh, that control it. For horizontal saccade, you need only and four muscle. For horizontal saccade, you need only two antagonist muscle and one center could be that that's why you don't succeed, to, you succeed to, to, to suppress more uh, the vertical one and not the horizontal, but it's not clear. We wanted to check, and the experiment that we did now is in order to check your question. So what we did, we know that in free viewing you have equal, almost equal. So we just told people to look at a, a diamond a different size. So we told people, look at the corners of the diamond. Each two seconds there will be a sound, and then fixate on one corner of the diamond. We began with very big diamonds, and then went to smaller and smaller till we reach diamond that the size of them is smaller than micro, that is in the size of micro saccade, and the uh, smallest diamond is the size of the smallest micro saccade. So you can see here, that the smallest diamond was a, a 1.7 uh, uh, um, minute a uh, degree, not degree, um, minute, minute. minute, and uh, and the larger one was almost uh, more than two seconds. So people did this experiment, and here you can see fixation going up and to the side of the diamond several times. This is with the largest diamond, and those are four participants on all sides of diamonds, and you can see that when you go smaller and smaller, still you can see here the diamond. In three out, this is already in the range of micro saccade, and you can see very nicely this one has large noise and did not uh, do it, but those three has diamond on the average. The red is the average the average movement across all trials. And so on average you have, you can see the diamond 
even when you go to the uh, to the smallest uh, movement. That means that people succeeded to do both vertical because when you move to one point to the other, you do both vertical and horizontal saccade. So that means that people can do it even if they don't have, or we should check whether they have micro saccade when they look, this is free viewing, they just go on the diamond. So this is six pixels, it's already on the size of the micro saccade, you can see that you have much more horizontal micro saccade even though the average is a diamond. And this is even smaller, the smallest one. This is in the size of the smallest micro saccade. And you can still see the diamonds. And when we look, after taking out the micro saccade, we take all the micro saccade out, and then we look what happened. This is probably the drift only. Then we see that people fix the die to, to have a diamond by doing using the drift, and the drift is almost solely vertically. So we get, even though we have almost only horizontal micro saccade, then by the drift we correct the movement and we probably succeed to have the diamond by using the drift in the smallest movement in order to, uh, to, to, to follow the diamond. So those are preliminary results. We should do more than that. It indicates that vertical drift is compensated for the loss of vertical uh, micro saccade, and that's how we follow up uh, object when the, we go into the range of fixation. The last subject that I want to talk is the most probably uh, uh, interesting one, is what happened during uh, three-dimensional viewing. When we do three-dimensional viewing, we have convergence eye movement. And when we look at convergent eye movement, this is from a work of Hussi, then we can see people looking while they have eye tracker. Those are the different saccades, what you see here. The places that are red are places that there is convergent eye movement that are uh, fixated at certain point. And uh, there are two possibilities that we use in order to reconstruct three-dimensional uh, three-dimensional object uh, when we uh, uh, by the visual system, uh, and I will just read it. In three-dimensional visual perception of object, the strategy used by the brain to extract information are not clarified yet. For example, it is not known that 3D visual perception is enhanced, it is known, it is known that 3D visual perception is enhanced by virgin movement that are controlled by stimuli feedback. So we use stimulus to, uh, to, to control the virgin eye movement. However, the precise relation between the eye movement and the processing of the 3D information is not established. And therefore, there are two big possibilities that people usually refer to the first one that is here. One possibility is that whenever the two eyes are stably fixed in the right distance, the eye operate, operate like a camera collecting from the 3D world series of still images projected into the retina. From this perspective, the cortical activation during the eye movement carries only little information, and what we use is each time we fixate in a certain depth. Like we do slices in microtome, and then we have two-dimensional image, and we contact all of them in order to get the three-dimensional image. This is one possibility. The other possibility is that I believe in it. Alternative view is that the brain constantly activates small and large virgin movement by palpation-like, like when we send our hand toward the face of somebody, we touch the, the uh, nose, and we go along the face, and we do palpation-like movement along the object. And this is a visual palpation hypothesis. According to this hypothesis, the brain reconstructs the 3D object from the space-time dynamics of the cortical activation in the course of virgin eye movement, not after them. This process is clearly object-oriented. You go to a certain object, 
and then you move along the object in the 3D space and you don't try to reconstruct the two-dimensional image. And that's what we tried to check. Now, people did not check it in the past because they don't have, the eye tracker don't have the resolution to do it. And that's why it was so important for us to, uh, to make the eye tracker much more uh, accurate. So a small uh, error in, in each one, uh, one of the eye creates an error of one centimeter in the normal plane in the distance it can be plus minus 10 centimeters. So if you want to do to, to see whether you go along an object, your resolution is much worse than what you are trying to check. So we, um, uh, so a systematic and quantitative characterization of 3D binocular eye movement during 3D perception, that was one thing that we checked. Defining the temporal relationship between eye movement and brain activities that we recorded by, from 64 electrodes on the brain. And we searched for common patterns between eye movement and brain activity in order to try to understand what happened when we suddenly saw. So first of all, we began with random dot stereogram. This is uh, using a stereoscope. When you use a stereoscope, each one of the eye see completely random uh, dot, but there is an area in the, two, uh, in the two images that correspond and it's shifted, one relative to the other, and if it's shifted in one direction, then you see a square going out, and if it's in the other direction, you see a square that is going in. So each one of the eye sees something that is meaningless, doesn't have any clue about the shape that you, do, you see, and only when the two eye is merging together, then you begin to see a 3D object. And we built a special device stereoscope that is going on the eye tracker. So you see it here, this is the eye tracker. And on the eye tracker, we put the stereoscope. So we can measure eye movement while each one of the eyes looks at a different image. And this is, for example, one of the images it's dynamic random dot stereogram changing 60 times per second. And when you see it with the stereoscope, you see the B that you see here on the right, that the white parts are going out and the black parts are going in. So each one of the eyes sees the stimulus, a meaningless stimulus. And if we go to places in the brain that are before the convergence, then they will not see the shape only places in the brain that do merge together and that they do have the 3D objects, those are the places that will respond to the shape that the people see. And what I will show now is just a preliminary result that we have for the few experiments we just finished to build the system in the last months and we have some result that looks very nice and that's why I'm showing them to you. But those are preliminary results. So, first of all, those are the eye movement while looking at the bee. The white parts here, the virgin eye movement that is before the screen, and the dark parts, this is eye movement, okay? This is the bee, and this is the eye movement while looking at the bee, okay? And this is the virgin eye, the place that the virgin two eyes met together. And what you can see is that the eyes met here before, at the place that it's ahead of the screen and the dark places are the places that they went inside to the screen. So it looks as palpation-like in this case, not in every case, in this case. In this case, what the subject had to do, they had to go with the mouse according to the shape. They looked at the bee and with the mouse they did the shape of the bee those are the eye movement, those are the place of the fixation, and those are the same eye movement, but here you can see the virgin, the places of the virgin, and it looks as if they palpate on the object. So this is one example, and here is another three examples. This is one subject, this is the second subject on the bee. Here you can see looking at a dolphin, and those are the places of palpation. You can see here the virgin eye movement 
looking at heart that was a three-dimensional and the center was deep, uh, was a head and the other was deep. And you can see that people do, excuse me, the center is deep, yeah, deep and the other one is outside. And you can see hints that people really palpate while they use this stimuli that is very unnatural. Yeah, it's a not, not a natural stimuli. The second thing that we looked at is what happened in the brain while we do it. So this is recording from 64 electrodes, EEG, triggered on the time that the random dot stereogram appeared. You can see a large wave in most of the, all the electrodes, and it looks very boring. And people who do EEG usually see very boring picture like that. Even though when you begin to look at details, you can see that there are different details, but altogether you see a wave quite uniform on all the cortex. And for just to get you, get, give you a, a sense, this is when they saw random dot stereogram. This is when they got a flash of light. So when you get a flash of light, also you do see a large uh, wave all over the brain, but this wave has the, co the, the famous component of N1, P1, and all the other components that people do succeed to measure from the visual cortex and other places in the brain. But altogether, you see that there is a very uniform wave all over the um, uh, brain. When you take just two electrodes, one during uh, um, the random dot stereogram, and the other during the flash, so here in the flash you do see the component N1, P1. I don't want to, to go into those details, but this is what you expect to get. And this is the wave that you get uh, while you look at the random dot stereogram. When you get the random dot stereogram, and suddenly there is uh, the stimulus appears, there is no change in light only changing the correlation between the two pictures. So if you look at the, at the scale here, the scale here is 0 0.4 and the scale here is 3. So what I show you is a very convincing wave, is a wave that is almost 10 times smaller than the wave that you get when you get a flash of light. So in both of them you get a significant wave all over the brain, but the wave is very small um, at the first glance of look. So what we wanted to do, this is another example of having a stimulus 60 Hz going out, triggered at the time that the stimulus was established. And we wanted to get more than that. <laughs> and in order to get more than that, we wanted to find out when did the eyes begin to move toward the target, meaning that the that the uh, subject began to see something in the three-dimensional world. And here are the, only the eye movement. So what you see here are the eye movement, the distance between the eyes. While there was, it's in Hebrew, bullet after bullet, it's stepping out after stepping out is a blue, stepping out, stepping in, green, stepping in after stepping out, red, and stepping in, stepping in, it's uh, uh, the cyan. And what you see is that around time of 300 milliseconds, people begin to see. People press that they saw not before 800 milliseconds. 500 milliseconds before they began to press on the mouse, the eyes know where was, a, where was a, uh, the target, and they begin to move and that we can do with our special device. And we can see the moment that they begin to move, even in single trials. This is average activity. And we can try to trigger the brain activity on that point, not on the stimulus onset, and not on the response of the mouse, but on the time that the eyes began to diverge, to converge. So this is brain activity. Uh, triggered on stimulus onset. The blue is uh, stucking, is, is inside, the cyan is outside, and those are outside after inside and inside after outside, triggered on stimulus onset. 
there is a nice response, and this is triggered on stimulus onset. <laughs> this is triggered now on the beginning of the I to move. Uh, uh, yeah, on the beginning of the I to move, and now you can see that those two became flat, and this is much more convincing. This remains the same, and when you do it on the target, you do things, see things, but it's a mess. So triggering on the time that the person pressed that he saw the target, the uh, variability is huge. Doing it on the stimulus onset, it's, not, it's good, but not as good as doing it on the time that the eyes are beginning to converge. And this is going to the spectrum analysis, and here you begin to see interesting things. So I showed you the boring, all the brain is working together. I want to convince you that you can get much more than that. So this is the amplitude spectrum recorded from uh, uh, this electrode here. And uh, you can see here an night evoke response. This is the average. Here you can see the green small, uh, the, the reaction time, the time that you press the mouse. And when you go to the, to the amplitude spectrum, you see nice, uh, nice large peak and then what is called alpha desynchronization that follows it. This is just amplitude spectrum of the mean. But uh, this is just amplitude spectrum. But when you subtract this average amplitude spectrum from each trial, by that you take all the locked activity out, that's what you get. So about half of the activity in this peak is not locked to the stimulus. It's locked to something else. This is after subtract subtracting the average trial from each trial. Uh, and what you see is the unlocked phase as, at, at the time that came. Time zero is the time that stimulus was onset. And you see that about half of the activity was not locked to the stimulus. And the death synchronized activity did not change. It's completely unlocked. This is known. Yes. Okay. I have another three or four slides. Now, this is triggered on stimulus onset. This is triggered on response onset. Here you see huge peak on response onset that is completely triggered on the, on the response because when you subtract from each trial the average response you remain from nothing. So you can really differentiate between things that happen in the brain due to the stimulus or due to the response completely and things that occurred because of them, but they are not locked on the stimulus or not locked on the response. And this shows you the stimulus, stimulus subtracting the average response, subtracting the average. And here you see a process that we developed that both the stimulus and the response remain, uh, remain in, in that sense because what we did, we stretched and condensed each trial according to the time between stimulus onset to response. And then we can see beautifully the stimulus and the response. You can see, see here, this is the stimulus and you don't see the response. This is a response and you don't see the stimulus. And if you stretch or condense the each trial to see whether processes, when you do longer trial, processes are evenly distributed in the brain, and when you do shorter trials, they the processes begin at shorter time course, then you can see it here. So this is one example, and this is my last slide. This is the few electrode stimulus. You can see here again stimulus, and you can see large desynchronization. Uh, uh, this is the place where it was recorded. This was recorded from the left hemisphere, and you can see it from the left hemisphere, and people use the right hand. So this is the motor event, probably. And when you use our technique, you see that this huge uh, uh, wave here that is spread become, when you use trigger on stimulus, it becomes one peak, and you know that it is the same because when you use this condensed technique, you remain with only one of them. And here, that's the other side. This is the left hemisphere. The right hemisphere doesn't have any locked part 
because he didn't move the left hand. And this is the frontal uh, electrode, and you can see here and that the, the condensed one is larger than triggered on stimulus and triggered to the response. That means that here in the frontal uh, electrode, things even began before stimulus was onset, and it is due to some internal processes because it's larger than doing it triggered on stimulus or doing it triggered on the response. And the last slide is just to show you the new machines that we build. This is a new one that just came two days ago from the machine work. And this enables us to record free of touching the electrode. The eye tracker does not touch the uh, electrode. And we have here the uh, stereoscope in front of the eyes. And we hope by that to do very nice recording and have much better uh, events to, to do the analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Amos. Uh, we don't have much time for questions because we have the following lectures, but please, those of you who didn't ask yet, shall we start? Did I understand correctly that you think that Remo and Chris are just noise and that microsaccades are... Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. But that, well, that's what people think. I do think that they help us to see. We don't have to do process in order to overcome them. But we, since uh, all the photoreceptors are more sensitive to movement, then what we use is uh, the movement of the eye during tremor and photoreceptor, and we analyze what was the movement from their response because all the my eye is moving towards the same direction, and, uh, and we do succeed to get, because of them, to hyperacuity. So hyperacuity is the ability to see five times better than the dense of the photoreceptor. And this is a phenomenon that people try to understand. And what we say, Eud, Achisar, and myself, is that when we move the eyes during the smallest tremor, we make small delta X into delta T, and the brain is very good in analyze, analyzing delta T, and that's why, how we get, get hyperacuity. So we don't think they can be completely random, and even though they are very useful. There are three sets of muscles. Uh, and the eye. Uh, Again? Uh, we don't, we, we, we don't, I can tell you what is in the literature, but we are, we are not, uh, we did not try to, uh, to uh, measure them. We went only to the small movement uh, there, and uh, we don't differentiate between muscle. We just see horizontal and vertical. Now, in order to see what belongs to uh, to both of them, you have to combine them again together and see what was the move actual movement that they d did, and we didn't analyze the compound uh, movement together, so I, I cannot answer it.